Tonight on NJTV News, the state wins another round in the fight over funding state employee pensions. The state Supreme Court's given Governor Christie a pass on paying an extra one and a half billion dollars. Unions call it a travesty and vow to fight it. Now what? A pardon granted by Governor Christie has triggered a debate over reconsidering gun laws and freed a young man to pursue his dreams. And saving New Jersey composers sheet music from decomposing. There's a story in those songs. Those stories and more next on NJ TV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Wells Fargo. Together we'll go far. And by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at NJAR.com. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thanks for joining us. First, they took a shot at state finances. Then the state Supreme Court delivered a major blow to state employee unions, ruling Governor Christie is not obligated to fully fund their troubled pension funds. As required by a 2011 law, Christie himself heralded as his biggest governmental victory before asking the court to declare it unconstitutional. It means the state won't have to scrape together a billion and a half dollars in the next three weeks. That's money the governor says he doesn't have. It also means both sides have to go back to the drawing board on the single most intractable political and budgetary roadblock they've got. The complex legal decision could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. David Cruz reports. So much was seen to be riding on this decision. Sure, there were massive budget implications, but Governor Christie's reputation and potential presidential ambitions were also at stake. On both fronts, the governor, who's in New Hampshire today, could be forgiven for doing an end zone dance. This decision is an important victory not only for our taxpayers, who simply cannot afford these unsustainably high costs, he said in a statement, but for limited constitutional government, that recognizes the proper role of the executive and legislative branches of government. The court ruled that Chapter 78, the so-called Pension Reform Law of 2011, was not, in fact, a binding contract. And while its goals may have been well-intentioned, the only way to make it binding on future governors and legislatures is to get voters to pass a constitutional amendment. The unions, needless to say, were angry. At the courts, yes, but especially at the governor. As New Jersey Education Association President Wendell Steinhauer put it, We're not sad. We're not scared. We're fighting mad. And we're fighting hard. Forget about the court. It ducked its responsibility. Forget about this governor. He's an abject failure. Our state's a fiscal basket case. And that's because of his failed leadership. If the governor continues to act irresponsibly by refusing to fund the pension, system according to the law, then we will call on Senate President Sweeney and Speaker of the Assembly Prieto to approve a constitutional amendment to be put forth on the ballot. That could be a heavy lift because while today's ruling affects around 800,000 people, the governor has been pretty successful at directing the narrative surrounding the pension fight and voters may not be particularly inclined to lend the unions a hand. I have to talk with the other members of all options that we're going to have right now. Uh, I'm not ruling anything out. I'm not ruling anything in. I am not going to speak for the assembly. And I would not have that conversation without having a chance to ta talk to my members. But it's something like everything else that's on the table. The court was pretty clear, if not downright emphatic, about who's responsible for fixing the pension problem. That the state must get its financial house in order is plain, it said. The responsibility for the budget process remains squarely with the legislature and executive. But the court cannot resolve that need in place of the political branches. They will have to deal with one another to forge a solution. And the loss of public trust due to the broken promises made through Chapter 78's enactment is staggering. Republicans were echoing the governor's call today for the unions to come back to the negotiating table. The major thing that this uh, decision changes is it sends a, a, a very big, loud message to 
I, my union friends, and I mean that, that they need to come back to the table and we need to come up with a long-term solution uh, to both take care of our public workers uh, and uh, take care of our taxpayers. You can't negotiate with someone who cannot and does not keep their word. It isn't possible, and you'd be foolish to try. And so I think he just doesn't have any credibility in this area. The union said they've given too much. The governor says they haven't given enough. And the court said today that both sides need to start talking to one another before the failure to fully fund the state pension goes from crisis to something much worse than that, as nine credit downgrades so far seem to be warning. So once again, the governor has managed to snatch a saving victory from the jaws of a potentially devastating defeat. What happens next is unclear, really, but the governor knows that with a court decision in his pocket, the onus is now on the unions to come back to the table, and any real day of reckoning has been put off into the future. In Trenton, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. The state Supreme Court has unleashed a powerful storm. There are threats of union infighting and legal fights, even a constitutional amendment. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron has been looking at what's next. That's right, Mary Alice. Uh, an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court is a possibility. There is a federal issue here. The federal constitution's contracts clause. Pretty unlikely that the U.S. Supreme Court, however, would overrule the state Supreme Court. It also looks like the Democrats in the legislature will fully fund the pension in the budget they're debating right now. The governor will line item veto that out, and they don't have the votes to override. And a constitutional amendment is also a possibility demanding that the government fully fund pensions and putting it on the ballot this fall, something they'd have to do by a two-thirds majority in August. How are alliances forming right now? Democrats, as we saw in David Cruz's piece, are lining up with unions and saying this is unacceptable, we have to do something, and they're trying to coordinate their strategy right now. Republicans are echoing the governor saying, come back to the table, unions. I put out a plan, uh, Pension Benefit Reform 2.0, it's sometimes called, yeah. and it would cut things, but it would preserve the pension system long term and that's what the Republicans are hoping that unions will do. It doesn't look like they are inclined to do that. Governor Christie is now saying his family is on board for a 2016 presidential run. What does this smackdown do nationally for his prospects? Uh, initially this is a big victory for Governor Christie but I think as a candidate for president it's a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand he looks like a union buster uh, he looks like Scott Walker taking on the public employee unions. On the other hand, it underscores that his state is fiscally kind of messed up, uh, and that can be used against him. All right. Thank you, Michael Aaron. Thanks, Mary Alice. And now to West New York, where the mayor was just reelected, and now he's indicted on fraud and bribery charges. West New York Mayor Dr. Felix Roque is accused of referring his pain relief center patients needing MRIs or CT scans to diagnostic imaging affiliates in exchange for cash bribes and campaign contributions valued at a quarter million dollars. The mayor's office denies the charges. A new development in who runs and redevelops a cherished green space. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Jersey City, where the New Jersey Sports and Exposition Authority may no longer have unilateral leeway to develop Liberty State Park land. Late last year, Governor Christie signed a law giving the authority control over developing the park. Almost immediately, he and lawmakers had second thoughts and vowed to change it. The Senate Budget Committee's now advanced to bill that strips authority over Liberty State Park from sports and exposition. That bill goes far beyond an assembly bill that would simply allow the Environmental Protection Department to approve any projects. Next to Princeton, where hackers are heralding Code for Princeton's first hackathon with hoorays. Seven teams of developers, graphic designers, and code writers worked through the weekend to create apps and websites to improve Princeton. They developed projects to track voting patterns, individual carbon footprints, and carpool opportunities. Other apps help Princetonians access parks and bike trails and the health records of local restaurants. The winners got an ice cream date with Princeton Mayor Liz Lempert. 
Want in? Code for Princeton scheduling bi-monthly hack nights all summer. Finally, Wildwood, where they've added to the shore's iconic Cedar Shake houses and doo-wop motels, an icon better known in Port Newark, shipping containers. Instead of sitting empty and rusting alongside the turnpike, 11 of them have been cobbled together to create the Artist Colony Art Box. The repurposed crates also house bathing suit shops and ice cream parlors and beach pass huts. The challenge for proprietors is to avoid tarting them up to the point where they lose their authentic character as, well, oversized shipping crates. Bonus, they're tight to the weather and portable. The next time a superstorm draws a bead on the boardwalk, the owners can rent a crane and a truck and haul it out of there. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, June 9th, 2015. Something up in your town? Tip us off. Governor Christie has granted a pardon to a man serving prison time for having a legal gun in his glove compartment. It's not the first time the governor stepped in on a gun rights case, but this time gun advocates see his pardon as an opportunity to reform the state's strict gun laws. Michael Hill reports. 24-year-old Stefan Josie Davis is relieved after Governor Christie pardoned him, wiping away Stefan's criminal conviction for mistakenly carrying his registered Smith & Wesson 9mm in his glove compartment two years ago. I was just excited. I let my family know, and we had a little celebration at the house, and it was just a, a blessing. Stefan says he had lost a lot, his armored car driver job, money saved to buy a house, and a future at becoming a detective inspired by the still unsolved murder of his grandfather in the 1980s in Patterson. This was, this was going to haunt me, you know, and being in court facing five to ten years in prison, you know, I had no opportunities after that. You know, my life was just ruined. Stefan's online petition for a pardon collected some 94,000 signatures, a fact not lost on the governor, who's issued just two pardons, one for Stefan and another for Shanine Allen of Philadelphia, both for illegally carrying a gun in the Garden State. I think this is an issue that uh, Governor Christie has struggled with in terms of uh, the right wing. And when he was a, a, a attorney general, you know, he was, he was actually arguing for sort of sensible gun reform, and that doesn't play very well in presidential politics. And so I think that this pardon is, is kind of an easy way for him to say, um, to repeat the message that he's been saying, that New Jersey's gun laws are absolutely draconian. And uh, as a result, he's going to give some leeway where he can, and he can do that in pardons. The governor has also vetoed gun legislation that the Democrat-controlled legislature has passed. But some of the gun lobbies say he's failed to sign an executive order to allow New Jerseyans to carry arms for the purpose of defending themselves. He has not done that. I mean, despite pleas, plea after plea after plea for him to consider it, I honestly think that uh, Christie's uh, determination to pardon Stefan was completely based on politics. I also don't believe that it will do him any good at this point. Stefan says he doesn't know about the politics or the timing of this pardon, but he says the governor took an early interest in his case. His staff interviewed Stefan to find out more about the charge and to find out more about Stefan. So I believe that he really took the time out to do this. If he, if he had another agenda for it, it still worked out in my favor and it's helping him, but I believe it was genuine. Whatever the governor's motive, his pardon allows Stefan to pursue a law enforcement career and potentially solve the three-decade-old murder of his grandfather. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Nothing has ignited Newark politics like Newark schools. First, there's the one Newark reform of public schools. Now, Newark's charter schools are outperforming the best of them. So when Assemblywoman Mila J.C. introduced a bill that would impose a moratorium on the growth of charters, people filled the streets outside her Maplewood office. Brenda Flanagan was there. 
The wheels on the bus stopped in suburban Maplewood this morning as charter schools brought about 100 parents from less affluent Newark neighborhoods here to voice opposition to a bill that would block charter school expansion across the state for three years. Tawana Emery's son attends North Star in Newark. My son has thrived since being in North Star. He's very bright, he's intelligent, he's happy, he looks forward to going to school. And not only that, the Newark public school system, let's be clear about it, it's in the toilet. It's hypocritical, it's reprehensible uh, that those who want to live out here want to dictate to those of us in the cities what options we have for our children. The moratorium is proposed by Assemblywoman Myla Jacy to let lawmakers evaluate how well New Jersey's 20-year-old charter school system is working. Protester Tawana Roebuck says it's working beautifully for her daughter. She's doing excellent. There are excellent teachers there. And it was a choice that I made to send my daughter to Rise Academy and not the neighborhood school. When I see parents involved, I think that's the best thing. JC says her bill would not freeze currently approved expansions at New Jersey's 92 charter schools. For example, Kip Seek School with 220 kindergartners and first graders in Newark could still expand up to its pre-authorized fourth grade level. What kind of problem do you think this is? New Jersey charters score well, according to a recent Stanford study showing 30 percent outpaced public schools in reading, 40 percent in math. In Newark, students attending charter schools got an additional year's worth of academic learning in math, more than seven months' worth in reading. JC wants public schools to benefit. We need to figure out lessons learned. How do we share those lessons and how do we make sure that every single one of our public schools is excellent? That's my goal. Charter corporations keep pushing aggressively to expand. They were on site here organizing the protest. JC acknowledged lawmakers could probably assess the charter system while it's still operating, but says they wouldn't do it unless faced with a moratorium. If the focus is to get other individuals to come to the table, you have a, a huge group of advocates right here that can be very helpful um, in driving that discussion. JC called for a discussion of charter schools, and she certainly got one, but with the volume turned way up as Newark voices demand to be heard. In Maplewood, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The second deadliest form of cancer in the United States is also among the most preventable. It's colon cancer, and research shows it disproportionately affects the African American community. Now a national alliance of church leaders, grassroots organizers, and health professionals have launched a movement to raise awareness about the risk factors. Brianna Venosi reports. African American patients are diagnosed with colon cancer at younger age. At advanced stage, African Americans have the highest incidence and mortality rate for colorectal cancer out of any racial group in the U.S. The five-year survival rate is close to 70 to 75 percent in, in colon cancer, but in African American uh, patients, it is at least 10 percent lower than the general population. Dr. Gunwant Goran of St. Michael's Medical Center in Newark says the theories vary from genetics to lifestyle, but the leading proven factor? They do not go for screening colonoscopies, and the reasons can be many, including um, lower socioeconomic status, um, uninsured or underinsured. We do know that uh, colorectal cancers come from colon polyps, uh, and typically uh, we are able to find these polyps during a colonoscopy screening exam and hopefully remove them. Unless a patient puts off that preventative screening, which can diagnose the polyp in a pre-malignant state. National guidelines call for a colonoscopy at age 50, but recommend it five years earlier, age 45, for African Americans. I've had three colonoscopies now 
And my first one after my father passed showed I had 13 polyps. Congressman Donald Payne Jr.'s father, whom he succeeded in office, died from the disease. Now he's part of a national campaign called Now is the Time to bring awareness and urge screenings in urban communities through religious outreach. What we want to make sure is that people get the message from uh, a trusted source, particularly in primarily African-American churches. Getting this message from the pulpit uh, is going to go a long way in terms of increasing the screening rate. I am willing to go wherever and speak to whomever uh, to make sure that families do not have to go through this um, terrible, terrible ordeal. Emerging research also suggests a gene mutation unique to African Americans puts them at higher risk. African Americans, both men and women, tend to uh, form more polyps on the right portion of the colon, which may be more difficult to get to with a colonoscope. Uh, they also, uh, perhaps through genetics, tend to form these polyps earlier on in life. At least two of these mutations that are unique to African Americans, that are present only in them and are considered to be the driver mutations for colon cancer. So yes, but let me make it very clear. This is all in research. It's not a part of any guidelines. There has been major progress in the last decade for treating the cancer, but as the doctors and activists put it, the best treatment is prevention. In Newark, I'm Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Few things are as evocative of a place or a time or a temperament than a tune. And by stringing tunes together, you can tell a story. A Rutgers team is now digitizing the history of New Jersey through a trove of songs written about us. Lauren Wonka reports. Springsteen isn't the only Jersey-born musician at Sing About the Shore. If you're looking for pleasure and nice sunny weather, why not take a trip to the shore? And turns out composers were poking fun at the Garden State since the early 1900s. Jersey. get a window into what people thought, what people did. You really get a vision of society that you might not always get from just looking at history books. Which is why Rutgers University professor Jonathan Saucedas had students comb through nearly 180 pieces of sheet music in their special collections university archives to study songs from the 19th and early 20th centuries. Music written by a Jersey composer or lyrics all about the Garden State. They compared them to contemporary artists like Sinatra or Bon Jovi and studied the historical significance of the old lyrics. It's how little the songs themselves mention, you know, uh, minorities, African Americans, uh, immigrants, but in the covers of some of these pieces of sheet music, uh, there are depictions of African Americans especially. Research assistant Trey Shore studied dozens of songs. What did you find? Uh, so I found a lot of pieces that were very positive about New Jersey. The idea that this state is such like a fertile ground for artistry and for musicianship is an idea that I think gets forgotten a lot of times. Professor Saucet is determined to keep this music alive. A team of Rutgers University staffers and students began digitizing the sheet music. They scan it into the computer following the standard set by the New Jersey Digital Highway. Each piece could be four to ten pages long, and depending on the size, the process could take up to 45 minutes per song. These materials are old, and sheet music to begin with wasn't set up to last forever. It was set up to be used. It gets ripped. Um, so, you know, it, it really is kind of a, a ticking time bomb as far as um, these pieces falling apart. Students have been creating an electronic card catalog of sorts. They hope the sheet music will eventually be uploaded onto a Rutgers website. And that will make them accessible around the world. Anybody with an internet connection can uh, can see what the music is. Most of the song recordings don't exist. These students already recorded three songs. I thought the most interesting part was definitely the like artistic liberty we got to have with this. I feel like to be a good 
musician, you have to be well-rounded. It's an important part, not just of musical history, but just as our history in general. Beautiful. It's very interesting to be the, one of the first people to hear this music in like 100 years, much less perform it. So far, about 30 pieces of sheet music have been digitized, only about 150 more to go. In New Brunswick, I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, the rent's too darn high. One in three of us is spending more than half our income on housing. How are we affording food and the rest? I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. It's easy to lose your way in a place like this. Does anyone know the definition of CPR? Kids in Patterson faced lots of obstacles, but nothing can stop their determination. My dream was to be a pediatric nurse. See that. Miss Earl taught me if I work hard, I can do anything. Mara had so much potential. It was my job to help her reach her goals. Now I'm headed to college to study nursing. There's so many talented kids like Mara, and they all deserve to live their dreams.